Hello everybody, I am going to um, lecture on chapter 3.6, The Art of the Renaissance and Baroque. Um, this is a very big chapter, has a lot of information, covers actually a lot of time periods, 350 years, so hope I can be brief. All right, uh, so Renaissance is literally the word for rebirth in Italian. Um, and when we say the Renaissance, we usually mean Italian Renaissance, even though it will travel to other um, northern countries. And what this means is a rebirth of classical Greek and Roman ideals and interest in the arts and humanity. Um, that's like the department I work in, the fine arts and humanities. That means uh, science, philosophy, math, and art. Uh, we'll cover the Reformation and Counter-Reformation, which will have a great impact on what is being made. So the Renaissance is broken up into the early, the high classical, and then the late, uh, which is mannerism. Uh, again, it's a renewed interest in the classical past. Uh, one of the reasons why is because things are being uh, unearthed from uh, a volcano um, that covered most things, including uh, things all over Rome and places that the new Italians would have found them. Um, and this idea of realism is going to come back. Remember, the Greeks were obsessed with trying to make things, sculptures move and look real. That will come back, and um, nudity will come back into um, sculpture and painting. So when we left off on the medieval chapter, we left off with Giotto, who I said is the sort of the godfather of um, uh, Renaissance painting. And uh, I talked about how he created a realistic amount of space in these, um, in his paintings. And he had a desire to do so. He paid attention to it. He wasn't just telling a religious story. He wanted to make a visual illusion of space. And he tried his hand at perspective here. This is an early uh, Renaissance um, competition. Uh, what would happen is um, churches would put out competitions uh, and have um, artists come and submit their work of art. And if they won, they would get a big commission. So this was for the baptistry doors. A baptistry is a, a place in uh, Florence, the church. And so they had these giant um, bronze doors. And the contest was that you would um, show the sacrifice of Isaac, a biblical scene. And um, if you won, you would do all the different um, Old Testament parts of the door. So this is uh, Brunelleschi's entry. And we see um, this is a story where um, Isaac is asked by God to um, sacrifice his son. Um, I'm sorry, Abraham is uh, um, asked to sacrifice his son Isaac. And so Brunelleschi here is showing the um, frightened boy, you know, he's kind of trying to wriggle away. And um, the father who does not look very determined to do it, he doesn't uh, kind of believe that God wants him to do this. And then it, this is the moment in the story where the angel is flying in to stop him from doing it. It was just a test from uh, God to uh, to Abraham. So that's um, Brunelleschi's. Gubertes is um, this one over here. And we see a very determined Abraham who has a knife pointed right at the son's neck and he's about to get him. And the son looks very determined not to be frightened. And we have this Greek classical body here. We have um, the father in a contrapposto pose. So this is the winner. It's uh, most classical. And um, don't worry about Brunelleschi. He went on to become a very famous architect all over Florence. All right, so there's that, Angel Stops. All right, a painter from the early Renaissance is Masaccio. Masaccio is uh, mostly known for, he and Brunelleschi both uh, came up with a linear perspective almost at the same time. So we see here that he's using, uh, this is the tribute money, a scene from the Bible. And in the background, he's using atmospheric perspective. 
but he's also using linear perspective here. We see all these angles of the buildings are receding systematically. Let me see this Roman arch that's making a comeback. Right, so all these lines, the stairs, the, the buildings, the rooftops, they all seem to go, be going to a point and the, it visually makes sense. All right, so so uh, Masaccio is coming up with a way of making space look realistic other than just fuzzy in the background. It says here Brunelleschi's, but Masaccio, I don't know. I kind of came up with it at the same time. Uh, our first Ninja Turtle we'll look at. He is an early Renaissance artist, um, Donatello. And this is his scene of David. And you see nudity has come back into art. And we have a very young David. This is the story of David and Goliath. David is a um, small, young uh, male. And he is um, given the task of slaying the giant with uh, a slingshot and then cutting off his head. So we see here, he's wearing this very fancy hat and he's carrying the stone, which would have knocked the giant down. And he has his knife or his sword and he's standing on the head of Goliath. And he looks like it was pretty easy, right? It looks very relaxed. He's got this contrapposto. It's very Greek looking, his pose. So that is the early um, Renaissance David, and we're going to remember that because this will come back around. But the Renaissance does happen in other places, so early Northern Renaissance, um, other things will happen later on. Netherlands, Germany, France, and Belgium um, will have the use of symbolism and um, oil painting. This is an important thing to note. Frescoes are used in um, Italy mostly because it's church architecture. A fresco is done on wet plaster right on the wall and it adheres into it. So if you use an egg tempera, they, they um, chemically bind. Um, up in the Northern art, they use oil painting. So they have glazes and they can create extremely fine details with tiny, tiny, tiny brushes. So this is Grunwald's. It's oil on panel. <coughs> Excuse me. And this is um, his crucifix here. So this is an altarpiece. These two arms would have um, closed. These, these parts of the um, altarpiece would have closed and they would have only come to here. You can see the size. So that Christ's arms would have looked uh, sort of cut off. And we can see this very heavy body, right? He looks very human and somber. Uh, we have um, Mary passing out here at the site. We have Doubting Thomas here. And we have a later scene here. Remember we talked about time in an earlier chapter. So this is the deposition where he's taken off the cross. Northern art, they love the details, and um, Germany in particular likes um, the very somber aspects of stories. This painting, um, your book does a great job with. Um, this is an important painting for us to look at because it makes some good comparisons for other things we've seen, and I think they'll sound familiar. So we have the Arnolfini wedding portrait which is what it's called. It may or may not be that. And we have that we know that these two are married. There's documentation on it. There's their little dog, their wooden shoes, there's some fruit, there's an egg, there's a mirror, there's a, um, candles, and there looks like a bed over here with a giant canopy. So an iconoclastic way of looking at this would be to look at every single thing in the painting and see what it symbolized to um, the, uh, the artist and his time period. So here we have um, the fruit on the window is a sign of fertility. We have the um, protector of women and childbirth, the figure carved on the chair. You see this little tiny detail here. Um, we have a single candle burning possibly a reference to Christ or that light, light, life is not uh, forever. 
and uh, some like the velvet hair and the elaborate bedroom and the chandelier would be a sign of wealth. The, the dog is a sign of fidelity. That's where the, the nickname uh, Fido for a dog comes from, fidelity. Possibly a wedding gift or a domestic scene, not wearing your shoes. The woman holds up her dress here, whether she's pregnant or just sort of indicating that that is the goal in marriage. And then more importantly for us, because this makes a great um, uh, comparison to other things we've seen that deal with mirrors, right? Way in the back, you see this, this would have been a very tiny little painting too. Um, we actually see the back of the two people and then where we are standing looking at the painting is uh, probably the artist who is uh, painting their portrait or making a drawing to paint the portrait. So again, we have this optical illusion with mirrors, very much like another painting we've looked at. All right, going back to Italy, and I should say I have um, omitted plenty of works in the chapter. This is a very, very big chapter, so I'm just going to cover the, the, the big ones that will uh, sort of work into the curriculum with other um, comparisons and things like that. Um, so beginning of the 16th century, we have the big names of the Italian Renaissance come into play, all working in um, Florence and Rome at the same time. And the Catholic Church will be the patron or the, the, per, the people who will fund it, mostly the Medici family. And uh, there'll be class, use of classical things with new improvements. So the, probably the most famous painting in the world and one of the most famous Italian Renaissance artists is Leonardo da Vinci. And here is his Mona Lisa. So here she is in a triangular format with the atmospheric perspective. Um, for um, Da Vinci, it's called sfumato. That's an Italian word meaning smoke. He loved this hazy atmosphere on everything. Even um, his brush style makes everything very textured. And um, it's known that she was, her name was Lisa. She was married to a man who commissioned this painting from Da Vinci. But rumor has it that he never let go of the painting. He kept the painting in his possession his whole life. He never considered it finished and never gave it back. Why is this the most famous painting in the world? Don't ask me. <laughs> it's, I, I don't even think it's his best. It's just, it's an icon at this point. Um, it's her smile. It's the mystery, mystery around it. Um, who knows? This is his fresco that was um, painted in um, a monastery refectory, which would, would have been the dining hall. And it's the Last Supper, as you know, it's a very famous painting. It is one point perspective. We can see that all these lines go to uh, the back of Christ's head. The scene is the Last Supper where um, Christ is revealing to his um, followers, his apostles, one of you will betray me. This is the moment of this painting and they are all reacting. Now this is a, a, a big thing in the Renaissance is to have individuality um, a study of a psychological state of mind and showing that in painting. This goes with um, a revival of humanism, an interest in humans' place in the world, Greek philosophy, questioning how to live, what's the right thing to do. So that's, that's how this painting came to be. And so everybody's reacting differently. Some of them are pointing to themselves. Is it me? They don't even know, like this man here is pointing. Is it me, Christ? Am I going to betray you? Right, so um, I'll give you a spoiler alert. It's Judas right here. He is in shadow, and he kind of just sits there staring. He does not know at this time in the story that he is going to be the one who betrays him, but he is. All right. Oh, I should mention this, mixed media cost damage. Uh, Leonardo da Vinci was a brilliant 
man. He considered himself to be a scientist, a mathematician, an artist. He built all kinds of machinery, including flying. Well, he didn't build the flying machine. He tried to come up with a, a way to fly, to make humans fly. But what he didn't do right is he used oil paint, which he um, was uh, sort of uh, enamored with from the northern uh, people. He traveled all around um, and he would have seen oil paintings. He used oil on fresco, which is water and oil, which uh, in his own lifetime, it started peeling off almost immediately. And um, they've done nothing but try to restore the Last Supper since he painted it. All right, so then we have uh, the other famous, or two other, two more famous um, artists, Michelangelo, and this is his David. We saw the Donatello's David earlier. Here we see a more grown-up David, a man, still in contrapposto, very relaxed, more muscular. Michelangelo loved to give um, uh, extra proportions and muscle tone to his figures. Um, we have his uh, hand, his gigantic hand. He's holding the stone there with the slingshot over his back. So the other um, David, uh, the Donatello David, he's standing on the head. The task is already done and he's relaxing. This David is staring off into space. You see he still has the rock and the slingshot, so he has not done it yet. He's a thinking man. He's thinking about what he's going to do and making a plan. This is the high renaissance thinking man. Your brains are just as important as your actions. And so, um, of course, marble sculptures are coming back just like the classical um, sculptures, idealized athletic body like classical art. Michelangelo's most famous work by far much to his chagrin, I should say. He always considered himself a sculptor, but he uh, worked for the Pope and the Pope wanted him to make paintings as well. And he was pretty good at it. So this is the Sistine ceiling. If you go to the um, Vatican, you can go into the Sistine Chapel and look up and you will see all of this. Some of the architecture is uh, fake and some of it is real. So some of it is just like these, things or these sculptures aren't really up there. Those are just paintings to make it look as if those are there, but these things are really there. So um, he made this optical illusion like that. So each one of these uh, scenes is part of the Old Testament. And probably the most famous scene is this one, the creation scene. And we have a very relaxed Adam waiting for God to infuse life into him. I should say a very muscular God and a very muscular Adam. And it took uh, Michelangelo four years to complete it, which doesn't sound so bad considering he was on his back on scaffolding with a uh, candle. And he fired his assistants nonstop. He was known to be a very uh, grumpy would be a nice way of saying it. grumpy man. Um, so he finished that and he went on to do many other uh, arts, art things for uh, the Pope. He did get to do a lot of sculpture. But 20 years later, the Pope asked him to come back to the Vatican and paint a giant mural behind the altar there. And he wanted him to paint the Last Judgment. So here we have it. So Michelangelo did live to be very old, especially for his own time. He's in his 60s when he's painting this. And it reflects the uncertainty of the late Renaissance, which we'll see other works do. Whoops, let me go back and point out where this is. So here you see Christ is here with his arm up. And remember from the um, section on medieval tympanums where all these people here can see they're kind of floating up and all these people over here you see how they're on these people are going up you can see like these angels carrying them up here they're going down all right so on Christ's left side are the damned to hell and you can see him with his arm up almost striking them down a very angry 
God. And then um, even these people are looking on like, I, I don't know, I think he's lost his mind. So this part here is a little uh, angry thing that uh, Michelangelo slipped in there. This is a detail. It is supposed to be the, um, the skin of St. Bartholomew. But in, in fact, it's it. This he was a flayed. He was a saint who was flayed. His skin was taken off, and Michelangelo put his own uh, portrait inside there. Sort of as a jab to the Pope for making him do this again. And our last Ninja Turtle from the Renaissance, Raphael, who was the youngest. I kind of did them in order of age. Leonardo was working a little earlier anyway. So Leonardo was an older man when Michelangelo was a, a younger man. And then Raphael was extremely young um, for both of them. Uh, and I should say that uh, Michelangelo and Raphael worked for the same commissions. They were constantly vying for the same uh, jobs. Um, for the Pope. Raphael um, was considered a darling of the Pope. Um, he did uh, die a young man though. So here we have uh, the School of Athens and this uh, Roman arch here and then the illusion of space all the way back. This is all just painted so all of these arches repeated and all the one point perspective that we can see all of these go to one point that he used. This is sort of like a synopsis of the Renaissance, all the things that will come back. These are uh, portraits of famous mathematicians, scientists, philosophers. Um, and what Raphael did was he put portraits of contemporary people in the painting, including himself and Michelangelo and da Vinci. This man brooding right here, all by himself looking like he's sulking. That's Michelangelo. That's how he was known. Um, and then we have uh, over here is Raphael staring out. And in the middle we have Aristotle and Plato who are arguing their different um, philosophies for how to lead a good life. One points up because they thought there's a life after after this and that the goal is to lead a good life and get there and one points here what you do on earth is um, the most important thing. So we have um, Aristotle pointing to the ground, we have Plato pointing up, Socrates over here debating with Alexander the Great, we have gods, we have um, Athena over here these are all um, poets and Pythagoras, mathematician, scientist, Euclid, um, who is a writer and a philosopher. So how he does this is he sort of puts them into little groupings. I like it. This is from your textbook. It says he pays homage to Michelangelo. I would say that he was maybe poking fun at him. Um, and then, of course, there's Greek sculpture there as well. So these are paintings. This is in the Pope's library, this um, School of Athens. The late Renaissance, um, things in Rome aren't going well. Um, there is a lot of corruption in the um, Catholic Church. Uh, because one family, the Medici, sort of install popes and leaders and they kind of control everything. And if you did anything bad and wanted to get out of it, you could um, pay the church and get out of your, um, your get away with your sins, I guess. And the only mannerist thing we're going to look at is this painting here, which is probably the most famous one, where artists are sort of taking... Uh, uh, what was learned from the Renaissance and um, reflecting what's going on in society at the same time. So we have Pontormo's deposition, a typical scene of Christ's body coming off the cross. But you can see here the proportions, especially this torso of Christ is gigantic, right? And we still have Mary passing out here, just like in the Grunwald. She looks, if she stands up, she's like twice as big as some people. And then the skin tone 
on some people. So everything is very distorted. It's elongated. It's out of proportion. The colors are garish. So it's not representational other than the muscular bodies, right? The faces look very lifelike. So mannerism is more like an exaggeration, if you want to think of it that way. And it reflects the anxiety of uh, what's going on. So that was the only late Renaissance mannerism. Um, we're going to talk about Baroque now. Um, Baroque is another um, art style that sort of um, reflects exactly what's going on in the Catholic Church in particular, and uh, which is highly connected to um, in society and, and history what's happening with war. All right, so um, the real thing that happens is the Protestant Reformation and then the Counter-Reformation. So because there's so much corruption in the Catholic Church, there is a group of people who leave the church out of protest and start their own sect of the church. And these are called Protestants because they are protesters. And that is a group of people who still go today, right? So there's st that's the split of the church. Protestants used to be Catholic and then they left the church. They believe the same things except for with corruption, a way to lead your life, and um, what type of art you'll make. What the Protestants really were outraged at is the vast amount of money the Pope is spending on works of art and architecture. So one of the things they change is what will be made, and that's why it's important to art history. So what the Catholics do is instead of um, saying, all right, well, we won't have spend so much money. They sort of double down and create a whole counter um, act where they uh, try to excite people and make the church seem very dynamic and come back to the church. Tintoretto uh, is one of our first Baroque artists, Counter-Reformation. And we're going to look at these works and see that they all have very similar visual things happening, even the Protestants. So here's Tintoretto's Last Supper. You can see the diagonal that goes through with the table and the swirling motions. Everything's sort of moving around. And we have this diagonal. We have all this swirling around. We have everybody sort of reacting. It's much like uh, Da Vinci's Last Supper, but except everybody's not lined up at a table all horizontally and stable as they were in a stable Renaissance society. Everything looks very chaotic. The light is kind of uh, chiaroscuro, but with um, these high glowing things. We call that tenebrism, right? Some of the angels look transparent, right? So the whole room is sort of moving around. Asymmetrical. And of course, when we have a subject that is um, the same subject, but such a different style, it always makes a great comparison. And you can see this is when the Renaissance, everything was so stable and calm and classical. And now a hundred years later, everything's changing and moving and dynamic. And this happens in sculpture too. We have um, Bernini, a very famous, um, Baroque sculptor. He did um, the Ecstasy of St. Teresa, which was in your other chapter. A nice little video on that. And we have this very similar things happening here. We have movement. We have this diagonal. And another thing that's happening is the moment. So we saw um, Donatello's after the um, the deed was done standing on the head. We saw um, Michelangelo's David before. He's thinking about it. And now we have during. The moment where he's he's already like pulled his arm back and he's about, he's determined, you can see his face, he's about to throw the stone. It's the moment where the story is going to sort of like the climax of the story. How great that these three guys did this for art history so we can make these nice comparisons. So we have early Renaissance, high Renaissance, and Baroque. 
right? And this makes a good comparison because they're all Italians and they would have seen each other's work. Well, he would have seen his, he would have seen his work. So the influence of one artist to another. Um, probably the most famous um, Baroque, Italian Baroque artist or painter is Caravaggio. This is the calling of St. Matthew. Um, Christ walks into a tavern to call St. Matthew. And St. Matthew does not know he's going to receive this um, calling. He is a tax collector and you see all these kids are helping him count money. This old man's kind of counting over his shoulder. And you see he's doing what um, the man in uh, The Last Supper is doing. Is it me? Are you calling me? And the story sort of unfolds by the diagonal chiaroscuro. And you can see that uh, Caravaggio is referencing Leonardo da Vinci, and he's referencing Michelangelo. As a matter of fact, Caravaggio's first name is Michelangelo. Um, so uh, we see, we can just follow the light. We see Christ's face is glowing, then his hand, then the boy, then this hand. All right, so he uses the diagonal and lighting to sort of unfold the story and make this aha moment. Caravaggio um, was criticized because he showed Christ going into a tavern. But Caravaggio was quite a rule breaker. He um, had a very tumultuous life. He was sort of a violent man. He uh, was uh, said to have killed somebody and he was living in exile till the Pope called him back to make more paintings. But his style is um, so seductive that everybody wants to paint like that because of the drama, right? So we have, um, we've looked at this one before. You had it on your last test. We have the diagonal, we have the lighting, and we have the moment, right? We have the moment in Caravaggio's where he's calling him. We have Bernini's where he's about to throw the stone. And now we have the moment where the knife is thrust in and Halifarnes is about to die. His blood is all squirting out. So the drama, the moment, the angle, and movement, right? This is implied movement. These are good things to remember for an exam. In the north, we have the same characteristics, but we will not have the same types of things. Remember, they're the the protesters have left because they do not, they think the church is getting too involved in um, imagery or worshiping idols, which uh, we talked about earlier. Jan Vermeer, woman holding a balance. All right, so this is a Dutch painting and it's just what we call a genre scene. It's a, a, it's a domestic scene where somebody's doing something at home even though she's doing a very specific thing where she's um, uh, weighing these, uh, these pearls or gold. All right, you can hardly see the balance here. She's holding her hand up in the moment as she's about to drop it on the scale. It's not very dramatic, All right, but we do have this lighting here, this diagonal. Vermeer um, almost always put a window on the left and some lighting coming on to the situation. So it seems like a very somber um, moment. We see the woman's probably pregnant. And then if you can see in the background here is the last judgment scene. So even though uh, it's a Northern Baroque, a Protestant painting, there is a reminder of um, sort of excess or lead a good life, right? Be humble. Rembrandt, uh, another uh, Dutch artist. This is um, a scene where uh, all these people have paid. It's a um, it's a group of people who have commissioned Rembrandt to come and paint like a group portrait, and he, he charges by the face. This is a gigantic painting. This is uh, the people are almost lifelike or life size. 
um, but you can see all this movement and it's not like uh, they're just standing in line in a pose. They're all doing stuff and they're all at different levels, uh, pointing and looking in different directions, right? So it's extremely dynamic, right? And we do have all these diagonals coming in and we have this Baroque lighting here. It's not really much of a moment. It's like the moment that this guy's going to give a speech, right? He's the, the head guy. All right, so Rembrandt. Um, and the other thing I should have said this before that happens in the North is artists start selling things on their own. They're no longer waiting for commissions. Vermeer made very small paintings. Um, there was what we call an open market where artists could make paintings and then people could go and buy them. This sounds like, well, of course, like that's how it is. You make paintings and people buy them. But up until this time, you actually waited for somebody to come and ask you for a commission or you won a commission in one of the contests, such as the doors of the baptistry, right? So now Rembrandt is going out and asking people, you know, do, do you want me to paint your portrait or going to businesses? And, it, you know, they're sort of working for their own. They're not working for the church, which opens up everything in a way. And we're not going to uh, leave that point unnoticed because it is very important for what's going to happen in the future to art. If artists can now paint anything on their own, they don't have to wait for somebody to tell them what to do, then we're going to have a lot more freedom or artistic expression or inventions of styles. All right, so those are all the Baroque things. And then landscape becomes very popular because if you're going to sell things to people who are just regular people, they're not the Pope, they're not the King, they want things in their houses. And I'm not saying these are just everyday people. These, of course, are wealthy people who can afford to buy paintings. They might want some landscapes, right? Even though he, he's still basing it on um, mythology, right? Uh, Poussin had like this... Um, uh, this recipe. He liked to frame his paintings with trees on the sides, like parentheses, and then move everything from um, right to left into the landscape. Right, so you can see he's using a little atmospheric perspective, some linear perspective, etc. And um, we'll end the chapter with uh, France um, because uh, soon um, art will travel from Italy to France uh, or the art uh, uh, styles or um, it, the new art will be in France rather than in Italy. And we'll have this man, Louis XIV, to thank for that. This is a painting by Rigaud. And we see him in all of it, or we see Louis in all of his finest, the Sun King, he called himself. That makes a very good um, uh, comparison to other Sun Kings we've seen. All right, people in power, reflecting their power through art. All right, you could probably think of several good comparisons this would make. We have him in his tights, in his pose with his. Um, his staff here, we have his crown here, all of his velvet and beautiful silks and his finery, right? So he commissioned Rigaud to come in and make him look great. <laughs> and of course he would display this at his palace where uh, people could come in and see and admire it. I like this, he's in his sixties. The artist painted him decades younger. Isn't that what we all want?